The fourth cranial nerve has a long and complicated course. It starts as a nucleus that lies ventral to the sylvian aqueduct and inferior colliculus at the caudal end of the third nerve nucleus. Its fascicles proceed dorsally and cross so that the right fascicles become the left nerve and the left fascicles become the right nerve. The fascicles exit the brainstem in the anterior medullary vellum and travel in the subarachnoid space along the inner margin of the tentorium cerebelli. The nerve pierces the tentorium to enter the outer wall of the cavernous sinus. It then enters the orbit through the superior orbital fissure but outside the extraocular muscle cone to supply the superior oblique muscle. This is how the superior oblique attaches to the eye. The muscle passes through a dural sleeve called the trochlea and turns more than 90 degrees to insert on the top of the eye. Here is an axial view of the course of the fourth nerve. It can be damaged anywhere along this route. This is what a right fourth nerve palsy looks like. The pattern of misalignment will obey the three-step test. Step one, in straight-ahead gaze, the right eye is higher than the left eye, a vertical separation known as hypertropia. The higher eye is torted outward, as indicated here by the displaced asterisk. Step two, in left gaze, the hypertropia increases. Step three, the hypertropia is greater in right head tilt than in left head tilt. When torsional misalignment is measured with the double Maddox rod test, the affected eye will display X cyclo deviation. This patient has bilateral fourth cranial nerve palsies, which create a large X cyclo deviation. With the two Maddox rods placed vertically, she sees one image as tilted. She has been instructed to turn the dial on the right spectacle until the two lines are parallel. She turns it to 15 degrees off the vertical meridian. Now she sees the two lines as parallel. There is one more feature typical of an acquired fourth nerve palsy. It displays greater misalignment in down gaze than in up gaze. Take a look at this patient with an acquired fourth nerve palsy. This patient has normal eye movements, but his eyes are very much out of alignment, which will become evident with the cover test. In straight ahead gaze, he has a small right hypertropia. In right gaze, the hypertropia disappears. The right hypertropia is most evident in left gaze, and especially when his eyes move into down gaze. The right hypertropia is also more prominent in right head tilt than in left head tilt. Therefore, he fulfills the criteria for a positive three-step test, which indicates a right fourth cranial nerve palsy. To review, step one, right hypertropia in primary gaze position. Step two, right hypertropia greater in left than right gaze. Step three, right hypertropia worse in right head tilt than in left head tilt. The third nerve palsy in this patient was caused by head trauma. Now let us track damage to the fourth nerve according to anatomic location. Lesions of the fourth nerve nucleus are so rare that you can almost forget about them. The fourth nerve fascicles can be hurt by lesions of the dorsal midbrain, expanding lesions of the thalamus, including infarcts and hemorrhages, and tumors of the pineal gland. At their dorsal exit into the subarachnoid space, the fourth nerves can be damaged by blunt head trauma 
as the moving dorsal midbrain collides with the stationary, knife-like margin of the tentorium cerebelli. Also occurring in this segment is ischemia to the nerve. Fortunately, such lesions resolve spontaneously within weeks. As the subarachnoid segment of the fourth nerve travels forward and pierces the inner edge of the tentorium cerebelli, it may become inflamed. It may also be crippled by a tentorial meningioma or by neurosurgeons on their way to operating on structures in this neighborhood. If the neurosurgeon merely nudges the nerve, it recovers. If it is transected, the damage is permanent. The cavernous segment of the fourth nerve lies ventral to the third nerve in the outer dural wall of the cavernous sinus. It can be damaged by any lesion in the cavernous sinus region, but the fourth nerve is the most resistant to compressive injury of the three cranial nerves traveling in the outer wall of the cavernous sinus, so do not expect to see an isolated fourth nerve palsy from a mass lesion in this region. The orbital segment enters through the superior orbital fissure remaining outside the muscle cone to supply the superior oblique muscle. This segment of the nerve is rarely lesioned, but superior oblique muscle weakness does occur here, perhaps because this muscle has a clumsy anatomy. After passing through a dural sleeve called the trochlea, the tendon turns backward more than 90 degrees to insert onto the sclera on the top of the eye. Perhaps because of this awkward course, the superior oblique muscle becomes less efficient with advancing age. The misalignment created by this type of superior oblique muscle dysfunction has a unique feature that differentiates it from acquired fourth nerve palsies. The misalignment is always at least as great in up gaze as it is in down gaze. Here's an example. In straight ahead gaze, the left eye is higher than the right eye, as you can see by the down shoot of the left eye when the right eye is covered. In left gaze, the left eye is barely higher than the right eye. And in right gaze, the left eye is much higher than the right eye. That misalignment in right gaze is less prominent in down and right gaze and much more prominent in up and right gaze. The fact that the vertical misalignment is at least as great or greater in up gaze than in down gaze almost always means that the patient has a decompensated superior oblique muscle dysfunction, an age-related failure of that clumsy muscle anatomy. This abnormality is never caused by an intracranial fourth nerve tumor, trauma, or inflammation but it can be mimicked by orbital trauma or chronic orbital inflammation as in Graves disease. Superior oblique muscle dysfunction can also result from trauma to the orbit, including surgery, especially if it involves the trochlea. In that case, the hypertropia is greater in down gaze than it is in up gaze. Congenital or acquired inflammation of the tendon sheath may prevent the tendon from sliding through the trochlea. As a result, the eyes can move downward and inward normally, but the affected eye cannot move inward and upward. Such a condition is called Brown's tendon sheath syndrome. Here is a case of acquired Brown's tendon sheath syndrome in association with a systemic autoimmune condition. Let's look right, left, straight ahead, up. Now up and to your left. Okay, and now up and to your right. Okay, now look away, all the way over to your right and up. 
and now straight up and now way over to your left that's where it hurts right yeah. here are some guidelines for evaluating non-traumatic fourth nerve palsy in adults if the palsy is the only pertinent neuroophthalmic manifestation and the patient has no history of cancer look carefully at the ocular alignment pattern if the hypertropia is equal in up gaze and down gaze or greater in up gaze than in down gaze you can reasonably blame it on superior oblique muscle dysfunction from that clumsy anatomy no diagnostic studies are necessary you might be able to palliate double vision with prism but eye muscle surgery will probably be necessary once the palsy is stable. If the palsy is worse in down gaze than in up gaze, and the patient has risk factors that allow you to blame it on extraaxial ischemia, you can defer diagnostic studies. Allow the palsy to recover spontaneously within three months of onset. If it does not recover within that period, you must reject ischemia as the cause and order brain imaging aimed at meningeal causes. If, at the outset, the fourth nerve palsy is accompanied by other pertinent neuroophthalmic abnormalities, or if the patient has cancer, you must call it non-isolated and promptly initiate brain imaging and other appropriate diagnostic studies looking for inflammation or tumor. Remember that myasthenia gravis can mimic a fourth nerve palsy, and remember that these guidelines apply only to adults. In children, even an isolated fourth nerve palsy must be fully evaluated, including brain imaging. Here is another way to approach diagnosis and management of non-traumatic fourth nerve palsy using a flowchart. First, make sure you have excluded the four imitators. Myasthenia gravis mimics any form of ocular misalignment, but it rarely fulfills the criteria of a fourth nerve palsy, which must obey the three-step test and display X cyclodeviation on double Maddox rod testing. An orbitopathy that causes swelling and scarring of the extraocular muscles can look like a fourth nerve palsy. Do not expect always to find orbital congestive features. They are often absent in the indolent and late phases of orbital inflammation. But an orbitopathy rarely has the cardinal features of a fourth nerve palsy, obeying the three-step test, and having X cyclodeviation on double Maddox rod testing. Third nerve palsy can look like fourth nerve palsy, especially if the major misalignment is in the vertical plane. But that misalignment will not fulfill the cardinal features of a fourth nerve palsy. Also, ptosis and pupillary abnormalities would not occur in fourth nerve palsy. Skew deviation, a component of the brainstem ocular tilt reaction, causes vertical misalignment but does not fulfill the three-step test or show X cyclodeviation on double Maddox rod testing. If you have excluded the imitators and have diagnosed a real fourth nerve palsy, decide if it is isolated, that is the only pertinent abnormality, or if it is non-isolated, that is one of many abnormalities. If the palsy is isolated, determine if it has features of a decompensated superior oblique muscle dysfunction, that is whether the misalignment is at least as great or greater in up gaze than in down gaze. If so, no further testing is needed. On the other hand, if the palsy is isolated but lacks features of a decompensated superior oblique muscle dysfunction, decide if you can safely attribute it to ischemia. An arteriosclerotic risk profile would guide you to that presumption. If so, defer diagnostic imaging and allow spontaneous recovery within three months. If new manifestations appear or the palsy has not recovered within that time, perform brain imaging and other appropriate studies. If you cannot safely presume that the palsy is ischemic, you must promptly perform brain imaging and other appropriate studies to rule out neoplastic and inflammatory causes. Now, if the fourth nerve palsy has other pertinent accompanying features and is therefore non-isolated, you must promptly proceed with brain MRI. If the MRI fails to reveal the lesion, 
go on to other appropriate studies, including lumbar puncture.